Hello, my name is Tim Weiskel. I'm a social anthropologist, historian, and a student of global agriculture. And as it turns out, I'm a member of the Tickner Society in Boston. What's the Tickner Society? Well, you can find out pretty easily by typing in tickner.org in any web browser. There you'll find that the Techno Society is an organization of book collectors, booksellers, librarians, historians, archivists, conservators, printers, publishers, writers, and all lovers and readers of books. Well, at least I qualify at the end. I'm one of those lovers and readers of books. But, how did I become a book collector as well? Is this something you want to become? Is it something you aspire to become? Is it something you trip over and become by accident? Well, in my case, it's a bit complicated. So let's start with the facts, just the facts, ma'am. As they say, the men in blue, when they put questions to you, if it were to be thought of in literary terms, you could say, for never was there such a tale of woe as that of Juliet and her Romeo. To quote a famous wordsmith. Just the facts, though. When and why did you start collecting books? When did you first realize you had become a book collector? Who led you down this path of life? Have you any accomplices? When did you first notice the problem of collection creep? What characters have you come to admire? Is there anyone you aspire to meet or would like to talk with? How have you been coping with the digital revolution, etc., 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 there are always endless questions from the men in blue. If the truth be told, I didn't start out as a book collector. My interest in acquiring books was an act of self-defense, as Mercutio might have said, or Romeo himself. It all started with AFS an intercultural program, American Field Service. This starts early in high school. On their website, you can learn we develop active global citizens. Sounds interesting. Sounds very interesting when you start looking at the pictures and you realize you can become an AFSer. At age 17, this was an idea that was very attractive. We develop active global citizens. Well, we love the nice notion of active global citizens. And so did others, apparently, endorsed the whole program. Invited us to the White House. Gave us a little speech and a pep talk. But, although I had Sweden in mind as part of the international exchange, it was not the destination chosen for me by the AFS Selection Committee in New York. Their plan was to send me instead to Syria, where I would get to live with a Turkish family in Damascus in 1963. So much for becoming a global citizen in Sweden. Whatever was going to happen, it was going to be in Syria, or as the French called it, Assyrie. And the only thing I could find at the time in Newton, Massachusetts, was a series of outdated postcards that were sold in a secondhand bookstore. They were attractive enough, although I didn't know what they meant. They seemed to involve a lot of historical buildings that had fallen down. Some of them different kinds of styles 
of architecture. Even I could see that. The arches. The <laughs> kind of triangles. And the backdrop of mountains. In fact, mountains were a big thing in this. Whole castles were built on the tops of mountains. Other castles were in the center of cities. This was a fascinating set of postcards. And if the culture was anything like it, I was in for quite a discovery. In fact, some of these things look really intriguing. Didn't figure out how it worked from the postcard. Had to visit it on site to realize ultimately it was the only solar-driven water mill, water pumping station that's been devised in the last several thousand years. Well, they had fantastic architecture. You could see it from their large buildings. And in fact, when you began to read a little more, if you could find anything on it in Boston in 1963, you learned it was the great mosque of Damascus built by the Omayyad Caliph in the year 708 to 715. Ah, that was older than anything in Boston. In fact, older than much of what had emerged in the Western world. The countryside was beautiful enough. And as it turns out, if you got inside those mosques, like the Omayyad Mosque, the beauty was overwhelming. Built a long time before even the oldest things I knew in Europe had been built. How was I going to make sense of these new impressions coming back to Newton High School? I had been immersed in this culture for a short time, but enough to make me curious. Who would help me understand the powerful personal experience I just had in Damascus? and throughout Syria, for that matter, and in Jordan, and Lebanon. Who knew about any of these subjects, or cultures, in Newton, or Boston, or anywhere, for that matter? Fortunately, the BU African Study Center came to my rescue. It was located over in Lenox Street at the time, and it was the one institution that could help me make sense of this. Basically, it happened all in this room. It was a seminar room that was the African Studies Seminar Room at the time under the direction of Dan McCall, an anthropologist and a historian who had just written a book. In fact, there were two key books written in 1964 during my senior year in high school, and I was invited to come along to the Center for African Studies over at BU in part because I liked this book that had been published in 1964 by the director of the center, Dan McCall. Another one that turned out to be important in my life, but I didn't know it at the time, was a book by Ruth Schachter Morgenthau called Political Parties in French-Speaking West Africa. But most significantly, Thomas Hodgkin was a figure who visited the BU African Study Center in the spring of 1964, when I'd been invited by my AP history teacher in Newton High School to come along to a few seminars at the university. Thomas Hodgkin had been the first to do a lot of things, but in his initial career, he spent time in Palestine and then throughout Africa. Well, the Palestine part interested me because I had just come back from Damascus. Maybe he could help me make sense of things. Well, as he found out later, his daughter published some of his letters. I had never seen them, obviously, and they weren't published at the time I met him. But he managed to convey some very interesting things about Palestine from his experience. His daughter then also went on to edit them other letters that he had sent back from Africa from 1947 to 1956. Well, I was born in 1946, so I figured this guy had been there during my lifetime, even though I was an infant when he had started. 
I hoped to meet him at some point, and there he was, in the flesh, well before his books got penned. I learned about his travels throughout Africa. They were pretty extensive. Back at the time when all the, you could get around with was a bush taxi and a DC-3, he's made several trips to Africa. As it turns out, seven trips to Africa, going to places that I'd never heard of, um, but wanted to learn more about after he started talking about them and showing us on the map where he'd been. It was pretty extraordinary. It traveled through quite a bit of the continent, becoming, as one of his students later who wrote a biography of him called The Wandering Scholar. Very interesting, very powerful impact on a 17-year-old coming back from Damascus. In fact, he'd written a lot of things about Africa after his time there and during his time there, including things like this, little pamphlets. This one called Africa in the Future. Freedom for the Gold Coast? Question mark. He went on to write other books that I did learn about and get hold of. In fact, they were published locally in Africa as well, and people started reading them there. He was quite an influence on a lot of English-speaking world because in Penguin books, he came out in paperback with African political parties. As a youngster, he had put together <laughs> most of this material, even though it was years before his daughter and other admiring students like Michael Wolfers put together both the biography and the collected papers. At the time, though, back in the 19... 50s and 60s, he was working on pamphlets that became very influential. In this case, he co-authored one with Ruth Schachter, who later became Ruth Schachter Morgenthau, on French-speaking West Africa in transition. As you can say, it was back in May of 1956. Well, as it turns out, I learned that he had become a fellow in Balliol College in Oxford, <clears throat> and he presided over a number of different countries becoming independent in Africa, and he had posed the key question, freedom for the Gold Coast, in that pamphlet of his. In the process, of course, he met the president of what would later become the president, became the prime minister at first, of a country known as the Gold Coast that took the name of Ghana upon its independence and was celebrated in this by the Queen herself, who made a trip to Ghana for the occasion. I have no idea. In fact, I doubt if there's any evidence that Thomas Hodgkin talked to the Queen. Uh, he certainly did talk to Kwame Nkrumah quite a lot, as we learned later. And Kwame Nkrumah invited the whole family down. Why not? Charles and his sister. Uh, they were all very, very decked out in their, as it were, ethnic habitats, except the president of Ghana, who got himself into a three-piece suit and welcomed the queen in his own gardens and showed her quite a celebratory time in Ghana itself. In fact, ending up uh, dancing with the Queen <laughs> just before they became independent. Well, in gratitude, in part, for all the work that Thomas Hodgkin had done with him, there was created by the first president, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkuma. Nkuma created the Institute of African Studies. And as they claim on their website, it's the first and oldest semi-autonomous research institute of the University of Ghana in Legon. As it turns out, this is something that Thomas promoted and suggested, and in fact became the beneficiary of, in one sense, 
he was the past director, the very first director of the Institute of African Studies in Ghana from 1962 to 65. So it was during that time, between 62 and 65, that he came in 1964 to visit Dan McCall, the director of the African Studies Center at Boston University. Later, Thomas Hodgkin went on to publish Nigerian Perspectives. And the idea of perspective was very important. When his students got together and published papers presented to Thomas Hodgkins, they used the word African Perspectives based on an earlier book he had written and compiled, I should say, of translations of documents and original historical material called Nigerian Perspectives. They kept the title Perspectives and expanded it to African Perspectives. And in fact, some of the students in Ghana who became very prominent professors, like Adu Bohan, Bohan, adopted the same terminology to talk about African perspectives on colonialism and some of their early works. So this is what was fascinating about anything he said to me as a senior in high school, as I attended the Boston University seminar series. He had suggestions from the field, partially based on his experience in Palestine and then throughout Africa. The suggestions were simple. There were four of them, just four of them that stuck with me. And I don't put them in quotes because I don't remember the exact words, but these were the gist. At least this is what stuck. Go to where there is silence. Where silence is. Listen to what they are saying, but dare not speak. Find your voice and learn to speak what they are not allowed to say. Pretty amazing prescription to a high school senior. Think of it again. Go to where the silence is. By this, he meant official silences, where you can't get an answer from people in power. Listen to what they are saying, but dare not speak. This is people in power who dare not speak it. It's also people who aren't allowed to say things in public lest they get in trouble. Find your voice. Now, this is kind of advice for journalists. <laughs> Not to fellow historians who were sitting around the table at this seminar in BU. But basically, he was saying, get out there and find your way of talking and learn to speak what they are not allowed to say. Pretty, pretty impressionable on a 17-year-old. At age 17, I was all set then to become an Arabist in college. I was excited about the Middle East. And I had every expectation of learning Arabic as a language and building upon the experience in Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, as well as my newfound enthusiasm for the life of a wandering scholar like Thomas Hodgkin. But then a funny thing happened on my way through college. I got to Yale and in the class of 68, but Yale had no Arabist. They had no one who would teach me Arabic. They had several scholars in Arabic language, but they terminated their interest in about the 16th century. They were interested in the translation into Western languages from the Arabic of various texts of Aristotle and other classics. Well, to the rescue came a very interesting organization and an even more interesting person, James H. Robinson who had founded a group called Operation Crossroads Africa, predicated on the idea of taking students like me in the midst of our college years 
out to live and work in Africa. He founded a group called Operation Crossroads to make this possible. Kennedy got wind of this one as well as that AFS program and started to talk to Reverend Robinson at great length because he had a plan to create the Peace Corps and he wanted Dr. Robinson's advice. Fortunately, he took his advice and set up the Peace Corps. Well, Operation Crossroads was really quite a unique institution at the time, but it became joined by the Peace Corps and others, which took Americans abroad in a different kind of role than they'd been used to in the past. As they suggested, challenge your perceptions, change your values, change your life. Well, this didn't seem possible in the middle of college until President Brewster created and co-conspired to create with the first professor of African history at Yale, a fellow named Prosser Gifford. The two of them co-conspired, probably because they had known each other at Harvard Law School, uh, to create a program called the Yale Five-Year BA Program. Actually, a very important um, initiative because if you dropped out of college at the time, you were likely to be drafted, very probably would be drafted into the running war the Americans were having with the Vietnamese. The only way you could be excused from that is if you had a student status. So Brewster created a program where you didn't lose your student status if you found a self-supporting job in the third world. As he put it, he wanted to do this in order to make it possible for young students to be able to go abroad without having to shoot someone. He was an anti-war president. At the time, that wasn't very popular. The other co-conspirators in this were librarians, specifically John Moore Crossy, an exceptional special librarian in the Sterling system who concerned himself with building up the collections of African material. So I had a plan. I applied for that five-year BA program in order to go out to Africa. This was 56 years ago. Like Thomas Hodgkin, 20 years earlier than that, I would travel through West Africa, write letters back to Crossroads Africa as their West Africa representative. And then in addition, I could buy local books and ephemera and send these back to my library collaborators at Yale. I was quite interested in this, in both aspects of it doing the reporting back to Operation Crossroads because they wanted a 10-year report on the first 10 years of their operations. And I was to do that by traveling throughout their project areas in West Africa. I would then write up the report, but in the process, I was going to get reimbursed for anything I bought for the Yale Library, a library that was hungry for newly published works in Africa. Well, so that answers the first few questions. When and why did you start collecting books? Well, I sort of acquired books from the Middle East on Syria, early on just in self-defense to learn about that culture. When did you first realize you had become a book collector? Well, I suppose when they started to refer to me is that, because I was collecting books for the Yale Library in West Africa on a job, a self-supporting job that qualified me to do what I wanted in that five-year BA program that Kingman Brewster had set up with Professor Gifford. Who led you down this path of life? Well, it has to be said a few people at this point not only the inspiration of Thomas Hodgkin and Dan McCall, 
But there were accomplices. There was a professor, Prosser Gifford. There was a president of a college, King Monrosta. There was a key librarian, Moore Crossy. They had to be said to be accomplices in some sense. When did you first notice the problem of collection creep? That's the next big question. Collection creep is like mission creep. Mission creep for any military person is when you go over to do something, but then you realize that it really implies doing something else a little bit additional to what you came to do. And then, gee, there's another thing you've got to, just to secure the mission, extend to your efforts in a way to um, make sure that your first effort is correct. This is what collection creep is all about. You start collecting one thing, but pretty soon it starts to creep in different directions. Well, it has to be said this started early on. Mission creep of book collecting started with, for me anyway, the postcards. As you may recall, I fell in love with cereal through its postcards. And then came to learn about the place. So too it was with Africa. I began to be interested in the postcards. And for <laughs> fortunate reasons, the Europeans were interested in these postcards too. They loved to take pictures of themselves and their buildings and their achievements. Partially because Europeans loved to take these pictures themselves, I became fascinated with them. Pictures of themselves and their conquest was something they specialized in in West Africa. Well, as it turns out, postcards are complex and compact chronicles of meaning that keep posing questions. They answer some questions, but they pose many more if you look at them carefully. And I started to look at them very carefully. What's conveyed by photographs? How do we keep an analog? How can you keep from creeping off into something you didn't entirely want to get into in the first place? Especially when you look at the domestic arrangements and realize that some of these French colonial officers had taken local wives. Very interesting. And, of course, they did what other white settlers did in other parts of Africa, uh, kill anything that they wished, and start chopping down um, <clears throat> rather large structures like trees like this. In fact, um, getting other people to help you was part of the effort. Uh, they'd have to saw these things by hand, but um, you had lots of free labor, as it were. And if you could get hold of machines, you could make things go a lot more efficiently and faster. And you could transform um, what had been rather, rather thick jungle into open, cleared land in a short order. Well, this is what I got into studying a bit uh, more closely and started to write, write books instead of just read them. And this was one of them, basically French colonial rule and the Baole peoples Resistance and Collaboration, 1889 through 1911, was a book that I published on the basis of a PhD, or as they call it in Oxford, a DPhil thesis. It wasn't all that pretty in its origins. It was published in 1980, so it's 33 years ago now. Actually, 43 years ago, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, and it's out of print. Though there's some movement to bring it back into print, mainly among French-speaking Africans at this point. But take a look. In 1980, I was struck by the literary parallels. People like Joseph Conrad had started writing. English was not his first language. Polish was. But he had learned English well enough to become one of the best writers in the English language and said rather compactly 
about the colonial enterprise, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. Well, I started to look into it largely because of the photographs. And paper and postcards were crucial in documenting all of this, but there's more to collection creep than paper and postcards. Other historical artifacts of the contemporary period are important in examining what was going on, and especially in trying to understand it. These documents are figurines, what are often referred to as African art, and sometimes referred to as colonial art, because they're clearly carved during the colonial period. Other contemporary historical artifacts include pictures that the Europeans love to take of people they had captured or were their opponents or allies. This historical form of documentation has yet to be analyzed in great detail, but we're in the process of doing so largely because these things can be digitized shared internationally and analyzed by groups of people who never talked to each other before. Art historians have never talked to historians for very much in Africa. They write books about the art. But every once in a while, people like Susan Vogel put out a fantastic book on African art and Western eyes. What is it that the Europeans see in this? And Phil Ravenhill had done a piece on individual figurines, the self and the other. Personhood and images among the Baole. Well, this is the group that I had spent time living in and working with. It's also the group that has an extraordinary array of carved implements having to do with violence and warfare. It's also the group among whom the French military officers took many wives. Something is very interesting in all different respects. Another kind of collection creep stems from this subject matter themselves. You remember the photo of the um, unhappy elephant here who met his end in the Ivory Coast. Um, and there are amazing photographs of cutting down a tree this size and then the labor that went into working these trees into squares and getting it out of the forest. Well, you can't help but think about the ecological impact of this. If you think 60 years ahead, 100 years ahead. So I began to think about steps towards an ecology of imperialism. What's the ecological impact of intervening like this and then taking pictures of it as if you're really proud of having done it? Well, it didn't start with the colonial period. In fact, if you look around, you don't <laughs> have to go very far to run into stone structures. And little garden plots where plants are introduced. Well, this made me think again of Dan McCall's book, Africa in Time Perspective. He was the director of the BU African Studies Center when he invited Thomas Hodgkin to come by. And if you look carefully at the subtitle of his book, it's actually pretty interesting. The discussion of historical reconstruction from unwritten sources. Now, he did this partially because he's an anthropologist as well as a historian, something that I have become as well, and largely because of his influence. He's the one who suggested that it's the unwritten sources that may be absolutely crucial for understanding African history. Because a lot of things are written in stone, 
these castles, for example, these are not spontaneous structures, right? They don't build themselves. And there is a silent and eerie eloquence of these stone structures that deserves to be investigated. If for no other reason that they required a lot of manpower. This has led to a whole new field of African history called the field of the prior plantations. You're interested in trying to figure out what labor force was necessary to launch the slave trade, to begin it. What kind of structures had to be put in place? What kind of infrastructure? What kind of labor force? What kind of energy? What were the energetics of the slave trade? Well, this is some of the questions that I had from reading old books. And I began to imagine an image, the agroecology and pathology of European empire. This is something I talked about earlier to the Tichnor people back in December 2020. So it's almost uh, two years and a couple months. You can get access to this stuff. It's online. And if you know anything about QR codes. You can scan them in and catch up with what I've been working on there. But more important, let's get back to the questions. Just the facts, man. Just the facts. So let's continue beyond the collection creep question. When did you first notice the problem of collection creep? Well, early on with the postcard. What characters have you come to admire? Is there anyone you aspire to meet or would like to talk with? How have you been coping with the digital revolution? Etc. Etc. So, what characters have you come to admire? Is there anyone? you aspire to meet or would like to talk with? Well, let's deal with them both at once. First, there are a lot of people that I admire, and I admire a lot of people I'd like to talk with. So some of the people that come straight to mind are people like Carolyn Elkins, because she's worked both on these source materials of the late colonial period and has had to deal with a lot of uncovered material, material that's been previously kept out of the public domain and out of public scrutiny. She teaches at Harvard University now, but I'd like to talk with her about her own experiences because I've been hearing a lot from her on the media. ABC News carried interviews with her recently, indicating under the title that Queen Elizabeth II's death renews discussions on Britain's legacy of colonialism. And in fact, <clears throat> she goes into it in quite some detail. As you can see from many of these frames that are framed in a yellow color, that's available on the website for you to listen to. And I'd urge you to do so. She's quite a a very accomplished analyst. She was born in 1969, which was the year I graduated from college. And my book came out when she was about 11 years old. So it's unlikely that she read it, even if she was interested in resistance struggles at the time. It had to do with French-speaking Africa and not with the central focus of the British in East Africa, which was the Mama Rebellion in Kenya. As she says in one of these interviews on ABC, we do not mourn the death of Elizabeth because to us her death is a reminder of a very tragic period in this country's and Africa's history. She's quoting from scholars in Kenya itself. And she points to the fact that 
the conversations are beginning again all around the world in the former British colonies, now grouped together in the Commonwealth, as to whether, in fact, they should be part of the Commonwealth anymore. She's given audio interviews as well. You can get access to the transcripts or listen to them live on WBUR here in Boston. Legacy of Violence, in effect, is the book she's written about it. And it's very important to get hold of these books. Another one that she's come up with specifically on Kenya and calls it Britain's Gulag in Kenya is called Imperial Reckoning. The Legacy of Violence is subtitled A History of the British Empire, a grand sweep, but a very capable and quite accomplished historian. So I'd look forward to talking with her about how this compares with French colonialism on the continent, for example, and what kinds of records do we now have on both sides of the linguistic barrier, French and English. Another person I'd like to talk to at greater length about book collecting at the end of empire and the beginning of the digital revolution, you might call it, is Dame Helen Gosh. She's master of Balliol College in Oxford. Now, Balliol is Oxford's oldest college. It was established in 1263. By the time that the Catalan Atlas was completed in 1375, often cited as one of the first documents to create an image of the African kings just south of the Sahara, and in particular, a portrait of Mansa Musa, thought to be the wealthiest man in the world at the time. The atlas, and this is just a fragment from a recent exhibit here in Boston, actually, not of the atlas itself, but of the gold trade. And that exhibit detailed the role that Mansa Musa had in providing gold across the Sahara to the European markets and specifically to the Medici. Well, Balliol was already 112 years old when that atlas was completed in its manuscript form in 1375. So Balliol's been around for a while. And it's had very illustrious people involved with it that have been entwined in the history of European overseas empires. It was the College of Adam Smith who came from the Scottish Enlightenment to spend time as a scholar at Balliol. And, of course, five years ago, the Rhodes Scholars gathered for their own 50th reunion at Balliol. And their coming up year, that is, the year they came up to Oxford. So in 2018, they all gathered. And they were among the first to welcome Dame Helen Gosch, or Gosch, as it's sometimes pronounced as the new master, Berlio, in September of 2018. Well, before coming to be the master of Berlio, Dame Helen Gosch was an accomplished and decorated former civil servant in Britain and someone with a long career of commitment to the importance of preserving historic, the historical record wherever it was found. In fact, she was previously the Director General of the National Trust for Places of Historic Interest or Natural Beauty, known more simply as the National Trust. And that group had conducted its own study detailing links to slavery and colonialism at 93 of its major historic properties. The Museums Association looked into it and did a kind of census of which of these great houses in the National Trust, preserved by the National Trust, and often uh, provided with tours by personnel from the National Trust, um, have any links whatsoever to the slave trade and colonialism. Well, a great many of them did. <laughs> 
And she came to Balea with that understanding that it was not just a college-wide program that needed to be established, but a kind of countrywide program. Balea's library is a dream for many book collectors. In fact, it goes back quite a ways, and its librarians are very skilled in finding what's in them. Under the direction of Seamus Haney, uh, Perry, who um, here, in fact, is professor of English literature at Balliol. And he's the one that's in charge of overseeing the library in its current form. Naomi Tiley is the librarian. And with a capable group of others, like Marissa Fuentes, they've been able to assemble a series of documents from within the Bailey collection that are very revealing about slavery and the slave trade. Several of their tutors are, in fact, focused on this issue as well and have just published in this realm a history of Toussaint Louverture entitled Black Spartacus. It was for this reason that they got together, both the master and the prominent dons and the librarians, working together to produce a new kind of exhibit, along with an honorary fellow who had just been recently named uh, from their alumni past, Oliver St. Clair Franklin, been made a member of the Order of the British Empire, and he's just been inducted as an honorary fellow to Balliol College. He had some original documents from the period of the Haitian Revolution documenting the history of the general, the Black Spartacus. And he shared them with uh, people in the college in charge of the library. Well, it's thanks to Dame Helen that Bailey has taken the lead in digitizing many of the important works in its collection. In its 750 plus year history, it has had a remarkable array of students and dons who became active in various stages of the British Empire and of global empire. From Adam Smith to the Prime Minister Macmillan to Thomas Hodgkin and other academics, Perhaps with this awareness in mind, Dame Helen Gosh established a program called, or a project, more to at the point, uh, a project called the Balliol and Empire Project. Thomas Hodgkin died in 1983, but in fact, he's remembered well by any of his students. And it's likely that the leadership demonstrated at Balliol's collections in highlighting its slave history archives will serve as an example to follow by other colleges and private collections of similar historical treasures in Britain. After all, Bailey is not the only Oxford college with a library and archival papers relating to slavery. All Souls College, one of the most prestigious academic institutions, has a large library called the Codrington Library, or it used to be called the Codrington Library, and still has a marble statue in its center um, celebrating, in effect, the Codrington family that made its money in Barbados uh, off of sugar plantations and, in fact, endowed the library. Libraries that contained, like Balliol's does, various histories like this, History of the Buccaneers, <laughs> Destroyers' voyages. Well, or like this one, Ligon's History of Barbados, complete with illustrations and details about how the sugar plantations were run. As I say, Dame Helen Gosh has, in fact, given this a new impulse and leadership to not only the Oxford community, but to the nation as a whole, in effect, because of her role previously in the National Trust. They put out a very effective 
account of what they did in the process in about an hour long video that you can watch again on the website just clicking on it very well produced and quite detailed the bailey and empire project is still going that that's the point it's just started and it's hoped perhaps that the papers of the hodgkin dynasty uh, can be preserved in this regard his daughter, Elizabeth, has been doing a great job with one of his sons, Toby, um, of preserving some of the family papers and publishing some of the letters, as you've seen. But there's a lot more to be done, presumably, because he, too, collected materials. As it turns out, the family, the Hodgkin family, is very, very <laughs> interesting and goes back in Oxford history um, for several centuries. In fact, it's his great-grandfather's brother, who was first named Thomas Hodgkin. And then his grandfather was named Thomas Hodgkin. His father was Robert Hodgkin. And <clears throat> basically, both his grandfather and his father were historians of major note. In fact, his father was principal, uh, a master of a alternate college, although he'd gone to Balliol, he was a, a master of a different college, Queen's College in Oxford. And it's an extraordinary family with long-standing commitment to listening, as Thomas did, to the silences. His great-grandfather was very noted at the time as being a medical officer and innovator. And in fact, it's for that reason that we have the term Hodgkin's disease, which is something that he discovered and documented and established in the British medical records. He was also an observer of the anti-slavery movement at the time and a participant in it, giving evidence to the parliament, a very key evidence on the impact on slaves of the horrors of the Middle Passage and the servitude that was formed. Well, Bellio College has continued, as I say, looking at the economics of these kinds of things. And under the recent mastership of Sir German Bone, just prior to Dame Helen Ghosh, there's been a revival of the critique of market economics, particularly with the work of Kate Rayworth and Gustav Speth. Gustav Speth was a Rhodes Scholar who arrived in 1964 in Oxford at Balliol to do his work and eventually ended up being a right-hand man to President Carter in the United States for the environment and was appointed the United Nations Development Program as its director, the UNDP, for quite a while. Kate is one of the younger economists looking into, as she calls it, donut economics, which is a very <clears throat> new approach uh, to critiquing the limits of market economics and the perpetual growth that it's predicated upon. Well, beyond the scholars at Balliol and the historians at Harvard, I'd be most immediately interested in meeting and talking to, at greater length, about book collecting in the end of empire and the beginning of the digital revolution with this woman, Chao Chiana Mena. Very extraordinary woman who's undertaken a number of projects. In fact, launched whole new traditions here, including uh, she's a co-founder of the British Colonialism Museum. It's really quite an undertaking. She's also a co-founder and interested party in the Open Restitution Project and the founder of African Digital Heritage, all of which you can discover on the web. Let's listen to how she describes her work. It's really quite fascinating. 
Because if anyone who has looked at documentation at the end of empire and the digital revolution at the same time, she's probably ahead of us all. I'm a digital heritage specialist, a history enthusiast, a cultural heritage lover. We're looking at the difference between 2D data. So here we have an image and then we have like a 3D digitization of a different object, but showing 3D digitization in the way that you can rotate and interact with objects. In my work, I look at interaction between technology and culture. I really delve deeper to ask some critical questions. We try to capture as many angles of an object. For instance, when we look at technology and culture, we always think digitization. But there are some critical questions like who is going to access the digitized data? How are we going to share it? Who's going to curate it? Cultural heritage is anything that anyone values and that can include your culture, which is a part of your life or a way of your life. Our biggest resource as Kenyans, as Africans, is the people. And once we have the skills, then you're equipping one extra person to do the job of documentation or presenting and talking about culture. Something you mentioned about um, ethnicity So skills are such an integral part of our advancement in cultural heritage and our place in cultural heritage. And I believe in that same way that it's not just institutions that need the skills, it's also audiences. I come from a family that's extremely proud of culture and history, so this formed a huge part of how I felt about myself at an early stage. But when it came time to go to university, I wanted to do history. People said, you can't waste your grades on something that doesn't pay. <laughs> so I ended up doing computer science, which I actually still loved. I did a master's in heritage visualization, so sort of combining my passion and my profession to work here today. As a young African woman, I've always had a complex relationship with my history in the sense that in the way it has been taught, in the way it has been shared in media, in the way it's been perceived. Our history has been shown as inferior or primitive, you know, and all the characterizations that we're used to. I think it's really important that we take back that ownership and say the story that is ours in our own way. We were governed by brutal regime. Social and ill treatment was a government policy. The response of the colonial state in Kenya was to try and hush things up. They essentially whitewashed everything that was put to them. And that's where, in a sense, the cover-up starts. They discovered this lost archive. So these documents were, they were eye-popping. It wasn't a, a dirty little secret, it was a dirty, enormous secret. The officials in London were fully aware of this. Persons at cabinet level in Britain, they got off the leash, they got out of control. Kenyans would like to know what happened. Kenyans would like to know their history. This is what we are fighting. Well, as an inspirational visionary on both book collecting and the digital revolution, you can see why I'd like to meet her and talk with her at some length, if it's possible. And because of the digital revolution, it seems that it might be possible tomorrow. Because she's speaking, in quotes, at least virtually, in the same seminar series where I met Thomas Hodgkin 59 years ago at Boston University in 1964. She's scheduled to give a talk called Visible Histories, Invisible Data, documenting the histories of migrated objects and archives in Africa. She's giving this through the Boston <coughs> University African Studies Center the same center that held the seminars to which Thomas Hodgkin came to speak in 1964. You remember the suggestions that he had and that his daughter has very capably transcribed, along with Michael Walfers, one of his students, and his principal biographer at this point, in the letters that he wrote back, both from Palestine and then from Africa. The last of his letters were written in the series while I was just five years old. But based on his years of work in Palestine, you'll recall that I 
jotted down notes that he conveyed to us. Go to where the silence is. Listen to what they are saying, but dare not speak. Find your voice. Then learn to speak what they are not allowed to say. He was saying to that as a form of advice to his Dorians, just setting out to do work in Africa. But it's applicable to anything, anybody who's a, a journalist or an informed observer of any kind. Especially, especially investigative journalists these days. Book collecting at the end of empire and the beginning of the revolution. Thomas Hodgkin was enough of a teacher to realize it's not so much what he said that counted, it's the quality of the questions he asked that would stick with his students. Freedom for the Gold Coast? Question mark? Well, these days, the same is true now for the new kinds of documentation that are being preserved and made accessible around the world because of the revolution, the digital revolution. Keep in touch on this score and see what's happening. You can scan in QR codes and learn more about any one of these projects. Thank you.